The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, first, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, today, we are having the March California and Nevada Dews Drought and Climate Outlook webinar. Um, I hope everyone out there is hopefully staying healthy and safe with everything going on with the um, COVID-19 and everything. And we appreciate you guys tuning in today um, because obviously there's other things going on like uh, drought, but then also the recent snow in California and Nevada. And so we're just glad you're able to join us today. Um, and um, thank you for those that have joined us previously. We have a good bunch of you guys that tend to come back on the regular. And thank you to those who are joining us the first time. My name is Amanda Sheffield. I am the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for NIDIS in California, Nevada. Um, this bi-monthly webinar series is designed to provide the region with these timely uh, updates on the current drought status, associated impacts, as well as a preview of developing climatic events. Um, I'll first want to note that this webinar is co-hosted with the California Nevada Applications Program and the ORISA team, and the webinar is being recorded. And so after this, um, the recording as well as a two-page summary will be available on draft.gov later this week or early next week. Before we get started, I just want to first mention a little bit about NIDIS for those, for those who don't know um, us from previous webinars. Our mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks. We were created by Congress um, to try to do this with the best available information and resources and make it accessible so people can be better prepared for um, mitigation, mitigating and responding to the effects of drought. And so we try to improve our understanding of how and why a drought affects the society, economy, environment. And we've done this through building um, a foundation of national drought early warning systems. You can see a few examples here um, that we work with networks of partners and stakeholders to share information and um, activities and actions that help the communities um, cope with drought. So as I mentioned, we have all these different series, uh, sorry, different sets of drought early warning systems. California and Nevada is one of them. We utilize new and existing partner networks to optimize the on the ground expertise of federal, tribal, state, local, and academic partners to make drought science and impact data readily available, easily understandable, and usable for decision making, hoping that folks will be able to better monitor, plan for, and cope with the impacts of drought. One last thing before we get started, I just want to mention earlier this morning, you may have received this if you're on our listserv, um, but one of these initiatives to um, share drought information, drought activities, and work that's going on within the drought early warning system is a brand new drought.gov site, uh, which will be launching later this spring, but in particular, the California Nevada page, um, which will have a new database uh, where we can share activities and they use it as an opportunity to connect and learn from each other. So we've created a, a Google form um, that you could fill in for um, your drought related activities and information that you would like to share so that we can highlight all the great work that's being done out there um, from research to operations to um, everything in between out there. So um, we're launching this now. We hope to be catering it over the next few months. Um, leading up to the release of draft.gov, but also for 
what what we, we we as a community would like to share and have out there so that people can work together more and know more about what's going on. Um, back to the webinar. So we have three great speakers today. Um, we have the Drought Climate Outlook from Ben Hatchett, who is a climatologist with the Western Regional Climate Center in Reno. Um, the Drought Climate Outlook by Pete Fickenshire, who's with the California Nevada River Forecast Center with the Weather Service. And our third speaker is Dan Macon, um, who is a UC Cooperative Extension Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor, who's going to give us some um, updates on impacts he's been hearing on the ground. So with that, I will go ahead and pass over to Ben if you're ready to present. Cool. Uh, hey, everyone. This, this is Ben Hatchett with the Western Regional Climate Center. And let me get that going. I'm going to share with you some of the updates about our drought and climate conditions after a kind of interesting winter season that we've had with a lot of snow to start and then a lot of not much except for warm and dry temperatures. And then we finally got a little bit of snow, which made a, a bit of an impact and improvement, um, but maybe not quite what we had, um, what we need or what we had hoped, but definitely made made some good, good improvements. Um, so our current drought situation, as told through the story of the drought monitor on the left-hand side, that shows our most recent March 17th update. Um, and we see abnormally dry to even moderate drought conditions throughout much of the northern two-thirds of California, western and central Nevada, and still no drought conditions in far southern Nevada and far southern California. And then there's a little corner of Elko County um, that is doing okay as well um, as a result of the um, some of the storms that passed us by actually kept those northern Nevada mountains uh, a little bit wetter and snowier. So these are pretty market changes compared to what we saw at the end of the year. It, uh, as of December 31st on the right hand side, you'll see just a small area in far, far northern California with abnormally dry conditions. But after a record in many regards, dry February in particular, but January was not, not too helpful either. Um, we see the reemergence of dry and moderate drought conditions throughout much of our region. So looking at the last 90 days, um, where we can learn to stop worrying, start seeing red, because um, we see a lot of red in both temperature departures from average and percent of average precipitation. Um, looking at temperature on the left-hand side, generally warmer than normal conditions persisted throughout the vast majority of California and Nevada, with a few exceptions in far, far southern, um, south southeastern California and the far northwestern coast. Um, notable warm anomalies throughout the central northern California region, particularly in the um, eastern side of the coast ranges or western side of the northern Sacramento Valley, Sierra Nevada, western Nevada, and particularly in northeastern Nevada. Um, anomalies on the order of three to five or three to four degrees. Uh, precipitation anomalies were also uh, pretty notably uh, low throughout this period um, in the range of five to 25 percent of average for this normally wettest part of our year. Um, not a lot of precipitation took place during this period. Southern California, again, did fairly well with a couple storms that moved through the region um, into southern Nevada and Arizona. So there are some positive precipitation anomalies taking place there, but by and large, very dry conditions. There we go. Um, thinking about these precipitation percent of averages in terms of departures, um, we start to see some pretty painful numbers. Uh, deficits on the order of eight to 20 or more inches uh, throughout the mountainous regions of Northern and Central California and Coastal California. There's also some larger negative anomalies in the mountains of the transverse ranges and um, kind of Central California and Coastal ranges, so south of Monterey um, and San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties as well, but very, very substantial departures uh, throughout the state, again, with the exception of Southeastern California, but particularly in the Sierra Nevada. Nevada overall rather dry, but a big caveat there is that the mountains of Nevada are not well resolved in these products, and we have very few observations in the mountainous regions of Nevada. So these are probably minimum estimates of dry departures. 
Other indicators also highlight some of these drought impacts that are beginning to emerge in the region. On the left-hand side, these, these all come from the uh, CPC land surface monitoring prediction uh, program. And we see soil moistures are very low, particularly in that northern um, coastal ranges of Northern California and into the Central Valley. Um, we know from some recent work that Dan McAvoy's done that these soil moisture and evaporative demand um, indices in these regions, when they look like this, that's, uh, that does not bode well for the, the upcoming fire season. Um, so that's something to, to consider. Um, not particularly notable evaporation anomalies in the center image there, but we do see um, consistent with the low soil moistures, which is probably driving the lower evaporation anomalies. Um, when there's nothing to evaporate, you might not evaporate as much as you could. Um, but looking at runoff on the far right hand side, we also see negative runoff anomalies consistent with those low soil moisture ranking values. So very little soil uh, moisture uh, available to evaporate or to help produce runoff. So now let's introduce a new month. We've had February buried and January buried and and all these fun months of lots of snow in the recent years, but now we can talk about February when it does not rain or snow in February. And in California this year, February was ranked the driest of February's going back to 1895 using the uh, California Climate Tracker statewide. This was the worst February on uh, record as far as that uh, analysis can be used to show um, by hydrological regions in the middle, um, record driest in many regions or much below normal for basically in the, the bottom, bottom tiers. But then again, you can see that southern third of the state is doing a little bit better um, thanks to some of those precipitation events uh, in mid-December. A couple stations really highlight just how notable this was. Um, Sacramento Executive Airport, which records go back to 1941. Um, we got a trace of precipitation on the 29th, so thank the leap year for keeping uh, us out of a zero value, um, but we have the number one record uh, for driest February at that station. Um, Tahoe City, which goes back to 1903 with good data starting about 1910, 1911. Uh, this was our third driest February, not far behind uh, 1912 or 1988, uh, which some of you may remember um, that prior drought episode. California 8 station index precipitation also highlights the substantial precipitation deficits. Um, we're actually behind 2014, 2015, which was a little bit surprising to me when I took a look at this. Um, we're doing better than the, the 77 uh, super dry year, but um, we got a, got a ways to go. And you can really see the impact there of that dry late January and, early, and February and into early March, where we just basically flatlined in the deficit grew dramatically because we normally expect to receive substantial precipitation during this time. The cause is ye old North Pacific Ridge, call it what you want, Omegasaurus rex bloxus is my favorite name. The ridiculously resilient ridge uh, may have wielded its nasty teeth yet again, and this blocking high pressure really just drove storms around either side of California. Um, either pushing into the Pacific Northwest or further south along the southern third of the um, United States and kept us high and dry. Um, the position of the ridge was a little bit interesting in that it may have facilitated the establishment of some very strong pressure gradients to become established over the Sierra Nevada. And we had a number of very strong northeasterly wind events, um, some of them pushing into the, the mid 100 mile an hour out of the Northeast um, and perhaps even stronger. Um, but by and large, this blocking ridge was the uh, primary driver of our extremely dry conditions. Turning out a snowpack, which thankfully we have a snowpack, that's nice after some of these recent years. Um, decent snowpack conditions exist throughout the Sierra Nevada. And throughout Nevada, the northeastern corner and kind of northern tier um, which has done a bit better this year as storms are sort of rushing by, um, doing a lot better compared to the central and southern portions of Nevada. Um, so snowpack wise, if we think about this in terms of percentiles or uh, percent of normal, we do have a snowpack, but it is on the order of about half of what we expect of our total April 1st average and about half of what we expect for this time of year. So some of the California DWR recent surveys, um, shown on the left hand side, you can see that we're kind of in that 50% range. Lower elevation snow tell sites using the 
uh, Central Sierra Snow Lab station at the top of Donner Summit. You can actually see we were doing very well early on in the season. Great start to the year. Everyone was very excited. Um, things were looking really good. And then it slowed down into January and really petered out. And we actually lost notable snowpack throughout much of February, um, leading to a lot of ouches um, being exclaimed as we saw that curve do things that we don't like to see it normally do um, in the middle of winter. Looking a little bit higher elevation at Carson Pass near Kirkwood, California on Highway 88. Um, did not lose as much or any snowpack during that period of time. And it was basically more of just a flat line where we can watch those uh, precipitation anomalies um, impact the snow in terms of no accumulation taking place. And then you can see our recent uh, maybe miracle march, or as we may call it, marginal march so far, unless it really comes through in the next couple of weeks, um, which is looking a little less likely. Um, big improvement in the last uh, few days from that roughly four to five day long storm event that really bumped us up a little bit. But we, you can see, as you can see, we still have a long ways to go. So some of the early season conditions were excellent, uh, making for good pre-AGU field work where we got to enjoy some very nice conditions at Kirkwood. Um, and the precipitation in throughout California in the early season really led to a nice green up. Um, this ni very nice photo from the San Ynez Valley um, showing the fine fuels greening up um, in mid-February. Um, hopefully we get a little bit more precipitation to keep soil moistures uh, recovering and improve fuel moisture conditions which will rapidly dry out as we move into a warmer and drier part of our year and with increased solar radiation as well. So the dry spell had some interesting downsides. Um, we saw a February maybe it was late January, wildfire, this photo was from uh, late February, on Peavine Mountain, northwest of Reno. Um, we don't normally see fires uh, in the Great Basin in the middle of winter, um, sometimes in the very early, uh, early winter, late, late fall, but this was a classic, uh, well, maybe becoming classic, I should say, a strange event uh, to see wildfire uh, on Peavine in the middle of winter. Um, the lack of precipitation and, and increasing solar radiation really led to some notable snowpack declines at middle and lower elevations throughout the Sierra Nevada. And then we had something we'd been missing, a deep low pressure centered off the coast of Oregon and California, fantastic snow producing scenario and Snow it did. Uh, on the order of 60 to 80 inches of snow fell in the upper elevations, making for dramatically improved uh, ski conditions and recreation conditions. Um, snow water equivalents uh, improved marginally in high elevations and very well in lower elevations. This image from the National Weather Service in Reno uh, really shows how the area covered by snow markedly improved, which is very nice to see um, after seeing many, many days and weeks of dry conditions taking place. Um, in terms of snow depth improvements, this event effectively doubled our snowpack um, in terms of snow depth. However, the three to eight inches of snow water equivalent that fell, it, it helped, but it really didn't get us out of, out of trouble. Um, the improvements were most notable in the northern and central Sierra Nevada, um, but you, as you can see, um, we were on the left-hand side pre-storm. We were pretty down in the in the doldrums, um, but we have improved to some extent um, in a lot of places after that event. Um, but we are still kind of in that below uh, 50 percentile range, which is not not exactly where we want to be as we come to the close of our, our wet season. So we're really hoping for an awesome April after a marginal March. So in terms of the snow enthusiasts, recreationals, uh, recreationalists, there was much rejoicing. And uh, I don't know, with everybody else, uh, it's better, but you know, we could do a little better. Um, come on, April. Reservoir conditions are looking pretty good. Uh, throughout California, we're pretty close to normal at, as per time of year um, at most all of the reservoirs. However, the concern is there's not a lot of snow above these reservoirs to uh, slowly trickle in through the spring and summer. And how our very, very dry October, November will influence runoff efficiency is also a question to, to remain um, and, and maybe think about as we move into that season. 
um, will we not see as efficient uh, runoff production as what snow we have melts. Um, thinking in terms of water supply to Southern Nevada and Southern California, um, Lake Mead and Lake Powell are operating at about half the capacity. Um, projections for the Colorado River are about 80% of normal, which is not, not terrible, not, not wonderful, but, but it's uh, decent, could be a lot worse. Um, there is a nice snowpack in the upper Colorado basin and the upper basin uh, precip and snowpack are pretty close to normal, a little bit below average precip, but above average or close to average, right on average snowpack. A um, couple take home points to finish up with. Um, another interesting year has unfolded overall, a, a very warm, dry winter. Um, big precip deficits, mainly due to the lack of precipitation uh, during January and especially February. We had an active snower than normal December, which set us up well for recreation. Um, likely helped lower our wildfire hazard in Southern California, but as we did not get much precip in January and February, big deficits resulted in drought area expansions. Luckily, we have some decent reservoir storage to, to get us through this, uh, we hope. March storms made an improvement, but we need more. Um, our snowpack's in poor-ish to, to fair shape. Um, one last note, um, so I'm covering for Dan McAvoy, who is very busy discovering a potentially skillful snow drought prediction tool um, in the name of his third child, Sawyer McAvoy, born this year in 2020. And all of his babies have been snow drought babies. And so we're wondering um, if, if that's a, a useful predictor. Um, we have a, a 2012, 2015, and 2020. So if you see or want to share with Dan, congratulations. Um, I'm sure he would greatly appreciate that. So with that, thank you very much. All right, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, we I forgot to mention to folks, if you have questions, please type them in the questions box. We'll get to most of them at the end, though we'll do quick ones here and there. Um, ben, why I'm changing presenters over to Pete, maybe you could answer this one. Um, the question is, are we seeing a shift of our seasons in California or are dramatic year-to-year -year swings in precipitation and snow the new normal? So that's an excellent top of the line question. That is exactly what we're pondering and, and mulling over. Um, seasonal shifts, the thinking right now is that we're seeing a uh, contraction of precipitation. Well, the projections suggest a contraction of precipitation towards the um, core winter months, so a drying and fall. But the substantial, that's gonna be superimposed with this very notable interannual variability um, that's also probably going to widen as well, where we'll have these extremely dry Februarys and Januarys or, or Decembers um, and occasional record wet dry January uh, or dry midwinter. So it's, it's kind of a, a mix of the two and untangling that's gonna be a bit challenging. Um, one thing to consider with all of that is another suggested projection uh, moving into a, a warming climate is we're expecting more precipitation to come from bigger storms. Something that we notably lacked this year. We have, I don't think we've had an atmospheric river impact the Northern Sierra Nevada this year, which is part of the reason we are struggling in terms of snowpack and precipitation. Um, so there's many pieces to the puzzle um, and that's an, uh, Excellent question and something that everyone is, is frantically trying to, to solve. Um, but I think by and large, the new normal, uh, or maybe as, as Mike Anderson calls it, the jump off point is really going to be this wide variability and superimposed with this um, contracting of our precipitation season. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, no more questions for right now. So we'll go ahead and pass it over to Pete. Pete is the service coordination hydrologist with the National Weather Service, California Nevada River Forecast Center. So go ahead and take it, Pete. Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> and thanks, Ben, for a good intro. Uh, covered a little bit of what I was gonna cover, but we'll try to add a little bit of a hydrology bent to it. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I'm with the California Nevada River Forecast Center. We work together with the state uh, Department of Water Resources to produce both flood forecasting as well as water supply forecasts uh, where we're looking out 365 days to help reservoir operators uh, manage their reservoirs up and down the state of California and in Nevada. And so 
what I'll be presenting is a little bit more of a bent on uh, water supply, but I think uh, Dan uh, after me will give a little bit more of that kind of local uh, short-term drought uh, impacts. So with that, I'll move on to uh, climate outlook, um, as well as my duties within uh, the office for producing river forecasts and water supply forecasts. I do try to take a look at climate signals to provide a translation of those climate signals into you know, a better water supply forecasting. And so uh, each week, the Climate Prediction Center puts out an update to their El Nino uh, outlook. And since El Nino and La Nina are kind of the two main predictors that we can really rely on for long-term prediction, uh, we'll start out with looking at what they've been uh, showing us. And this is from uh, March of 2020, looking out again into the summer and into the fall, predicting still a kind of a continuation of where we've been for the, uh, most of this past uh, winter, which is basically ENSO neutral conditions. Um, there is a hint, one of the forecasts there that's on the, on the low side is uh, what's called a CFS V2 is hinting at a La Nina prediction for next winter. Uh, but that's still, at this time of year, uh, they typically say that there's a spring barrier to really having a, uh, a skillful prediction out that far. One of the things that the CPC had kind of mentioned there uh, made note of in their ENSO blog was that if you look at all the neutral years, that this year is that purple line here kind of hovering between zero and 0 0.5 degrees Celsius in the central Pacific uh, waters. So staying below that El Nino threshold through much of the winter, um, if you take all the neutral years for the past 70 years or so, very few, if any, have ever kind of descended back into a La Nina uh, situation. So that's one of the reasons they're not sure uh, what the, the future holds in terms of um, next year's uh, climate outlook. And so when they came up with their outlook for the next uh, several months, again, uh, the red bars would indicate the chance for a El Nino conditions, which for the spring is we're kind of more likely to be in these gray bar areas, which are a neutral forecast probability. And then moving into the fall, the La Nina uh, odds do go up and are slightly above the norm, but still um, it's really anyone's guess as to what's gonna happen uh, further out into the future. And so their summary, uh, as a most recent summary is that ENSO neutrals are, are, are here and likely to stay and uh, that We'll see what happens as the, the months move on in terms of uh, future uh, conditions changing. And I like this uh, cartoon. I think it kind of presents a little bit of what we've been in with uh, this past year, trying to predict or trying to get a sense of what's happening uh, in the climate signal. With El Nino and La Nina taking a break, uh, we've been looking a lot more at some of the other climate teleconnections to see, is that what's given us these you know, really uh, dry month like we had back in February. And so one of those, one of the team there in the tug of war is the AO, which is the Arctic Oscillation. And there's been a few articles and I've seen people talking about how Arctic Oscillation really has had a pretty big impact on uh, the weather patterns we've experienced over this past winter. Uh, with the real, the bottom graph here shows that ever since about January 1st, the Arctic Oscillation has remained positive uh, for the last two and a half months and going on three. And so that is left, uh, if you look at the top graph, uh, a lot of the cold air trapped uh, over the polar regions, north polar regions, which tends to kind of lift the storm track further north. And so um, in this situation, we've actually had uh, the Northwest, Seattle, Washington, Oregon, that area has gotten quite wet during this past year as the storm track was able to impact their area, but left us mostly high and dry. And so it's been strongly positive. In fact, they even reached a record level of uh, positive Arctic oscillation back in February. So that seems to be a, a real strong indicator of what kind of led to our dry situation that we had. I know Ben 
and I showed a similar graphic here, um, showing again that high pressure off the coast of uh, North America, and that most of our storms then have kind of tended to start up north, and when they do kind of filter down to California and Nevada, have tended to come from the north instead of uh, directly across the west, leading to just mostly a drier situation. And how's that going to impact the rest of the spring? Well, again, in the spring, the north, the uh, jet stream tends to lift north anyway. And so even though, kind of going back to that uh, outlook for the Arctic Oscillation, it does show that perhaps here at the end of uh, March, we will see something at least closer to neutral for the Arctic Oscillation. Some of the models are predicting a, a negative Arctic Oscillation. Some are predicting a more positive. Uh, outcome. So at least we're seeing a break in that Arctic Oscillation, but whether it's really going to open the door for more storms in the spring really is hard to predict because of the, the shifting that happens during the spring. So the CPC, as they come up with their um, outlook for the April through June time frame, um, and we've seen this almost every spring, is that the temperatures continue to show uh, a likelihood of being above normal here in the kind of 60 to 70 percent chance that we'll be above normal through the, the springtime. But more importantly, looking at precipitation, uh, again, that, that dry tendency uh, is still showing up um, with the area around the Oregon, California, Nevada border being most likely to, to be below normal in terms of, in terms of precipitation. While the southern half still has a equal chances of getting uh, normal springtime precipitation, which is really what we've seen. A lot of the storms have had this north to south track and then actually turning west or turning east um, into southern and even into Baja, California. So, what does that mean in terms of our drought outlook? Um, Ben had some really good uh, pictures of the snowpack. This is one of my favorite cameras to look at at Yosemite, looking out over the mountains uh, to the east of Glacier Point there. And this was from March 4th, and you can see the real minimal snowpack we had after that really dry February. Much of the snow had already melted all the way up to seven or 8,000 feet. Um, and then as Ben mentioned, we had a nice one storm anyway that left quite a bit of snow. But again, this is just a one storm, and a lot of that snow is focused really around the um, kind of from about the I-80 corridor down to about Yosemite or so was where the, the bulk of the, the uh, snowpack fell. And a lot of other areas still ended up being lighter than normal. But compared to last year, this is last year's um, photo at Glacier Point where you can see a much, much larger snowpack. So again, while it was a good additional amount of snow that's going to provide some additional water supply. It wasn't uh, really as much as we had been hoping for. Uh, ben also showed a similar slide here, again, showing the percent of average uh, snow at a lot of the snow pillows um, uh, by the USDA. One area just to highlight, though, there was some better uh, precipitation up in the northern part of Nevada. So for those of you in northern Nevada, that's the one area that seems that has so far escaped the uh, encroaching drought, um, while most of the region has uh, seen drought continue to expand over the course of the year. And then, again, our focus at our office is water supply. And so, again, we take a look at those dry soils that came into the year, our below normal snowpack, run it through our uh, hydrologic prediction models and come up with a, an outlook for how is the rest of the snowmelt season going to progress. And you can see most of these numbers are, uh, we've seen some improvement, you know, again, right around this uh, central part of California where we finally have gotten above 50% of average. But again, the Southern Sierras, a lot of this area up in the Northern Sacramento Valley are still below 50% of a, a water supply forecast at this point. And one way we try to look at this again, what are the trends over the past uh, year? Uh, this is what we call our water supply uh, tracker. 
And so each day we're running our models, making a forecast of how things are progressing. And you can see that again in the October through November, these green X's, which is our median forecast for the Central Valley of California, those X's were falling quite rapidly as, as the weather was quite dry uh, during those months. Saw a good improvement during late November and early December. And then from there, things tended to move downward until just about, oh, about two weeks ago, we finally started to see a turnaround uh, with these March storms, which is in more or less average, to maybe slightly above average, giving us a little bit of improvement, but again, far from a miracle March in terms of that water supply outlook that we're, we're seeing. And so we're currently at about a 50% of average uh, if you kind of look at the whole Central Valley of California as a whole. And uh, also looking again at um, water supply, one of the big pluses on our side is that we did have a good wet year last year, a large uh, snowpack, which lasted well into the summer months. And so reservoirs were able to bank a lot of the, the snowpack runoff that we saw last year. And so up in the north, Again, Shasta, Oroville, up in the 90 to 100 percent of average um, reservoir capacities are percent of average for current uh, storage, and so they're they're uh, coming into the springtime at least pretty full, and even into the San Joaquin Valley, there's more above average uh, reservoir conditions, and still near again that 100 percent mark in a lot of the southern. Tulare region uh, reservoirs as well. And so again, looking at the drought outlook, uh, when the, the Climate Prediction Center puts out a new drought outlook, they try to wrap all this together in terms of the, particularly the, the precipitation outlook for the next three months. And so that dry forecast for the northern part of California, Nevada, that translates into this map, which is our drought outlook for uh, the remainder of the next three months, March through the end of June, where the dark brown is already where drought is currently active and uh, development is likely in much of Northern and Central California, as well as Central Nevada. Um, but again, the two places that seem to be avoiding it so far have been Southern California and that Northern tier of Nevada. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, there is one quick question. Um, I this may refers back to some of the, the part where you were talking about the oscillations and things. Um, I know there has been some interesting research on the decadal oscillation as being a significant factor for predicting ocean temps and climate. Is your group considering this in its models? Uh, it's not being considered directly in our models. It's it's more of a qualitative understanding. Um, we do look at that when we're kind of uh, making our fall outlooks for the year. We kind of look at the Pacific Decadal Oscillation to see um, if there are any indications there that might help us give at least a qualitative look of how the year might progress. But in terms of actual um, integration into the models themselves, uh, not at this point. Great, thanks. Um, with that, we'll switch over to our third speaker, who I mentioned before is Dan Macon with UC Cooperative Extension. You wanna go ahead and take it, Dan. Great, good morning, everybody. And thank you for the, the invitation. Um, just to kind of give you, if I can make this work, there we go. Give you a little bit of background, and I thought it might be helpful to give a little bit of background on rangeland livestock production systems in the foothills here. Um, our annual rangelands are maybe a little different in terms of season and, and drought impacts. Um, and then talk a bit about some strategies that, that we've used and that others, others are using right now. So I am the Livestock and Natural Resources Advisor with Cooperative Extension covering four counties kind of here in the North Sacramento Valley and, and Sierra Foothills, Sierra region. Um, we also ranch. We've got a, a small-scale commercial sheep operation just outside of Auburn. And uh, I don't know how you put this on your resume, but I, I did ranch through the 2011-2015 drought, um, which is certainly informing 
kind of the things that we're doing now with, with dry conditions. So we're predominantly cow-calf operations here in, in our part of the state. Um, there are a few mixed cow-calf and stalker operations where they'll bring in outside um, yearling cattle um, when we've got enough grass. Um, there are very few purely stalker operations in the Sierra foothills. We've got an increasing number of small ruminant production, um, mostly sheep, but some goats as well that are mostly focused on niche markets and targeted grazing primarily for fuel load reduction. And just to give you some sense of, of how this fits in, in most of the operations in our region, um, annual rangeland, unirrigated land represents about half of the annual forage base, um, but about 80 to 90% of the land base. Um, you know, it takes 15 to 20 acres to support a cow and her calf on annual rangeland for 12 months, um, whereas an acre of irrigated pasture will support that same animal unit. Um, and so it, it is a fairly extensive system in that regard. Our forage calendar um, can kind of be simplified like this. Typically, most livestock are on annual rangeland from mid-October through at least mid-April and sometimes into the end of May. Um, and then they transition into either irrigated pasture or uh, mountain meadows, primarily on federal lands. In a normal year, we'll hopefully get germination on our annual rangeland um, early enough in October that we've got enough day length and, and air and soil temperatures um, to support grass growth. Um, that didn't happen this year, especially. Um, and then usually we'll end our growing season sometime in mid-May, depending on elevation and, and year. Um, and that varies to some extent as well. Most of the foothill locations have an irrigation season that lasts from mid-April through mid-October. Um, if we're on surface water like I am in our operation, there's really no option for getting water earlier or extending the irrigation season if we have a dry fall. We're pretty well set on running from April 15th to, April, to October 15th. Um, most of the, the Forest Service grazing in the mountains to my east um, happens from kind of mid-June um, to late September, early October. Um, and so uh, livestock follow the green up into the higher elevations and then typically will come back down um, onto annual rangelands in the mid-fall months. Most of the production calendars try to that that folks use try to balance forage supply and demand with their marketing needs. So we do have a, a substantial number of cattle operations in California that calve in the fall, which allows those weaned calves to be shipped off of rangeland in the late spring um, and, and really take advantage of that spring flush of forage growth. There are some operations, mine included, that lamb or calve in the spring to try to match peak nutritional demand with peak forage quality and quantity. And what I mean by that is that, for example, with our lambing ewes, and there's a picture of our, our sheep there on that slide, um, our forage demand almost doubles during the period of lambing without our actual numbers of sheep changing. Those ewes eat almost twice as much grass when they're nursing lambs as they do when they're, when they're not lactating. And so that's part of the consideration as well. And then marketing windows can also influence those production calendars. So um, if there is a need to sell feeder cattle um, to stalker operators in the Rocky Mountain states, those sales typically happen in May or June. And so um, California producers try to have calves that can be weaned and, and go into those sales um, in that time frame. So our current conditions, and this is not any surprise based on the other two presentations, but uh, most areas in the foothills had an, an exceptionally dry fall. Um, we actually had a little bit of germination in Auburn in September, but then we didn't get any precipitation until almost Thanksgiving. Um, most of the rangeland um, sites in, in my counties didn't germinate until late November. And usually by December, we're too cold and the days are too short to support much grass growth. So we had green grass, but it really didn't grow um, late fall, early winter. We're all 
painfully aware of the exceptionally dry and warm February. It was the driest on record here in Auburn. Uh, we measured just three hundredths of an inch at our home place. We also noticed that um, phenologically things were very different because of the warm temperatures. So this is the picture of the first um, set of lambs that were born at our place on February 23rd. And virtually all of the blue oaks at that elevation, about 800 feet above sea level, were leafed out by then. Based on my um, lifetime of living in the Sierra foothills, that's about three to four weeks earlier than normal. And we really noticed the impact under the oaks. Um, typically, there's enough organic matter under the oaks that we hold soil moisture better. But once those oaks leafed out and they were drawing more water out of the soil, we saw vegetation start to wither under the trees this year. Um, we had three and a half inches, and I like that term marginal march. Um, but uh, I made the mistake of looking at soil moisture at the root zone this last week, and we're still far below saturation point, um, which is, is uh, consistent with what, what the observations were earlier. So in terms of livestock production, um, the warmer temperatures have increased grass growth. We're at or above average on the land that we haven't grazed. Uh, measurements at the Sierra Foothill Research and Extension Center confirm that. But the areas that we grazed in January and February have virtually quit growing. Um, they'll grow a little bit now that we've had some rain, but, but forage is very short at a time of year when it should be growing rapidly. We're also seeing a lot of our annual grasses mature early, which you would expect in, in warm, dry conditions. And the impact from that, from a livestock production standpoint, is that as those plants mature, they lose nutritional quality and they become less palatable to livestock. So they taste bad and they're less filling um, in, in many regards. I think the lack of soil saturation is also problematic. We're not seeing our seasonal creeks run and so we're not filling stock ponds and, and even in places where some folks have grass, um, they can't access it because there's not stock water in those pastures. I think at least in, in our part of this year, we've got enough water storage that we should be okay this summer irrigation season. Um, but most of us are always looking at least six months ahead. Uh, we can graze dry forage if we provide supplemental protein. That protein feeds the, the microbes in a rumen's digestive tract, and so we can utilize that lower quality dry grass. Um, but what we grow now kind of tells us how much we'll have the, the rest of the year until we get germination again. And if we have lower total production, um, that can be problematic going into the fall. I think the other point that's that's kind of emerging, at least for the folks that I work with, is there's this growing tension between the need to reduce fuel to prevent wildfire in the fall and the need that all livestock producers have to actually save some feed for the fall months. And um, you know, a year like this really highlights that tension. If fire danger is going to be higher, there'll be a lot of pressure to, to graze through things that we, we might otherwise save. I um, want to talk a little bit about how ranchers kind of make decisions about how to deal with these conditions. And this is really um, the foundation for this work was some interviews that Dr. Leslie Roach at Davis did in 2011 before the last big drought. Um, but really people's drought adaptation strategies depend on their ability to set goals and their internal management capacity, but also on their previous drought experience. And that's, that's certainly been true in my case in looking at, at the current situation. Um, we did a follow-up um, number, of, a smaller number of interviews with cattle, sheep, and goat producers in 2016 that really drilled down to look at drought preparation and response strategies that folks used. And I'll, I'll go over those really quick here briefly. We had cattle um, producers, which you see in the, the left hand there. We had multi-species, primarily cattle and sheep, and then sheep only producers that were part of this survey. And really some fairly um, similar strategies that people used to be proactive in planning for drought. Um, Conservative stocking rates and, and stockpiling forage or resting pastures primarily. Um, but also there were there were folks that we found that had already identified animals that they would sell in order to reduce their stocking rate if it did turn dry. 
In terms of the reactive strategies, I think a couple of things to note here. Um, we in extension like to tell ranchers that you shouldn't try to feed your way out of drought. And yet many of the ranchers in the last drought did purchase extra feed. Um, I think we need to understand that from an economic standpoint a little better. Uh, many did apply for government assistance as well. Um, and, and that continues to be a, a, a reactive strategy that I think will be important just to keep people whole economically. So in terms of putting these strategies into practice, I think um, it's easy to look at those, those strategies kind of in a vacuum, but we also need to think about critical dates. And one of the challenges is that had I, for example, had I decided to sell sheep because of a dry February and then got rain in mid-March, I, I would feel really stupid for making that decision. And so we need to think about those dates, but also what actions we should take at each particular date. And that should really be based on our production calendar and kind of the logistics of making those decisions. Um, if we're gonna do, for example, if we are pregnancy testing cattle, that might be a time when we could make some decisions about cattle that we might sell during dry periods. We also need to look at short-term versus long-term impacts. Um, if we've invested a lot in our genetics, for example, if, if somebody is raising purebred bulls, um, maybe selling animals isn't um, a long-term viable strategy, but, but needs to be done in the short term. And that really relates to that cash flow issue and, and kind of our return on investment considerations as well. So just to give you some sense on how two different drought years might vary in terms of strategies, this is, this is our own experience. Um, in 2013, 2014, I, I actually was working on another operation in Rio Vista and the Delta. Um, we lambed out 1900 commercial ewes that year and we fed our entire year's worth of alfalfa in December and January when it was so dry. In our own operation, we reduced our bread ewes by about a third in late January. Um, we sold ewes that typically were less productive. We moved to new winter range in February um, of 2014 and then ultrasounded the remaining ewes that we had to determine whether they were pregnant. We sold those that weren't bred before we started lambing. And then we also weaned early um, to lighten up the, the load on on the dry forage that we'd have available the rest of the year. This year, because it was so dry in November, October, November, um, for the first time ever, we moved our bread use to alfalfa stubble in the Sacramento Valley, um, which allowed us to rest our, our winter range, um, but also represented a fairly significant expense to us. Um, we had learned our lesson in the last drought, and we keep really careful grazing records. Um, so we did a lot of extra planning to figure out how much grass we had ahead of us this year. And, and we actually um, moved sheep to some areas that we hadn't grazed in years past. And anything that looks at us funny, which is sheep herder humor for saying anything that didn't come in with a lamb or has other health problems when we wean the lambs in June will be sold just to make sure we've got enough feed in the fall um, to carry the use that will be bred. But so far, I think that the point for us is, and part of this I think is conditions, but part of it is that we have experienced that, that the last drought was far more severe than the current drought in my experience. Um, just a, a shout out again to Dr. Leslie Roach. We have been working throughout extension to collect and organize on the ground reports, um, looking at both quantitative and qualitative observations. Um, we've seen these maps earlier this morning, but but um, I think those observations have helped us really understand what's going on on the ground. And uh, if you're interested, um, I do some fairly regular um, updates on forage and, and weather conditions through Instagram and, and uh, on Twitter. And with that, I'm done as well. Great, thanks Dan. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but doesn't mean there's not going to be a few. So I'll give some folks a couple minutes to ask their questions for any of the speakers. Um, while we're waiting for that, I first want to say thank you to all our speakers, to Ben, uh, Pete, and Dan, for your great presentations. These are really informative and I think 
give folks sort of up to date on where we are coming closer to the end of the wet season here. Um, I just want to remind folks that the recording of this webinar will be available on the Drought Deck of YouTube later this week. Our next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, May 26th. The registration is already open on Drought Deck of itself. Um, actually, let me pop up the information so folks have it. Um, see if there's any questions. Here we go. Um, let's see. Um, there's one person who says, I have a question. If you could type it in, that'd be better than us unmuting everyone. But in the meantime, I'll go down. Oh, wait, here I see it. Um, so this is for Dan. Would you please, please explain how irrigated pasture in the valley would affect beef and, and other cattle operations? Sure. Um, so irrigated pasture is, is a really important component of, of kind of the um, annual forage calendar. Um, it is, as I said, typically far more productive than, than uh, rangeland forage production. Most people will take um, either pears or, um, or feeder cattle and graze them on irrigated pasture during the summer months and then put the, the uh, class of animal that has um, lower nutritional demand on annual rangeland. So dry cows or, or um, bulls might stay on annual rangeland, whereas the cattle that need more nutrition or that we're trying to put weight on would be on irrigated pasture. And, and so there is a, a lot of back and forth between those pastures and, and annual rangelands. Did that answer the question? I think so. Um, and then there's one more. Is, um, I think it was your last slide. You were mentioning that, like Twitter or a few places to follow you. Someone asked, where is the Instagram for rangeland updates? Uh, if you go to um, at follow at flying mule, yeah, I do a I have a IGTV channel on forage and and weather updates in the foothills. Great. Um, I can be. I can be sure to share some of those resources with the post webinar email for folks too, so they can be able to find you um, by clicking through the post webinar email and things like that. Great. Yep. All right. Um, at this time, I don't see any other. Oh, oh, never mind. There are lots of other questions I keep seeing. <laughs> <laughs> they pop up hiding at the bottom. So, Dan, I see you use the US drought monitor um, in your planning. What other drought indices do you use? Oh, I use the drought monitor quite a bit, and we use the Outlook um, map quite a bit as well um, to to kind of see what's over the horizon. Um, and then um, we have I have been kind of a weather geek most of my life, and um, we track site specific precipitation and forage conditions as well. Um, the Sierra Field Station. Flips forage uh, monthly, and that's been a pretty useful tool to kind of see where we are in terms of forage production in real time as well. All right, I think that the, think that's uh, the final final questions. We get some thank yous in the question box, so <laughs> thank you all for listening and thank you for the speakers. Um, if you want to know information about drought in California or the California Nevada dues, please let us know. Um, we do have a post webinar survey that should pop up when you leave a webinar. Those us, gives you guys a chance to tell us what exactly you'd like to see in these webinars. Um, if there's topics you want us to cover, research, anything in the gauntlet sort of that people are interested in learning about, that's your chance to let us know. So with that, I'll go ahead and close the webinar and say thank you, everyone. <laughs>